Good morning, folks. I hope you caught the compilation finale of Solar Superstorms last night. The idea was to compact it all to be shared as one video. We'll get some news on that front today as we begin at spaceweathernews.com and we find the last day on our star very quiet. We've got active regions shining brightly but with tiny sunspots beneath them. The dark, larger patches and thin tendrils of the coronal hole systems are visible as well. Both ace and discover solar wind here. The stream has been relatively quiet and geomagnetic conditions are following suit. But also notice that ace is starting to have that density pickup issue again, about 10x below discover, which is going to screw up all the models on ISWA, which again nobody should be using because it's obsolete. Top quakes of yesterday struck Greece, strong but luckily not in a populated area, and in Puerto Rico. The Caribbean rumble was about being above average for the region rather than top overall magnitude. We're going to the moon up next, and now there is even more evidence of recent moonquake activity. I can remember a few years ago when such suppositions were laughed off by most of the community. Not anymore. Up next, an interesting bit about the last Cron magnetic reversal on Earth. Now, these are not the 12,000-year cycle magnetic excursions that flip and flip back. These are where Earth's poles flip, and they just stay that way for a few hundred thousand years. Now, they are bumping up the occurrence a bit in the timeline for the last one, but the real kicker is they say there was a 3,000-year period between the transitions. Now, when you scale 3,000 years in the Cron reversal cycle down to what that would be in the magnetic excursion cycle, it would only be lasting a few decades and then rebounding to recovery. It had been thought that the Cron transition took much longer, while to be honest, we think the excursion transition is likely shorter than a few decades. The cosmos are up next, and we're looking at a newly discovered megastructure hiding in plain sight. Gigantic arcs shining in UV light are seen as strings in the image, but confirmed relentlessly. These arcs are shining in UV because of the energy within the arc, which almost certainly makes it a plasma current or saturated magnetic field. Either way, very cool, or not cool with how it's shining in UV, I suppose. Anyway, up next, we're trying to march forward on the cooling flow problem of galaxies. Basically, the star formation in galaxies at the cool core center of larger galactic clusters are only producing stars at 1% of the predicted rate. They thought it would be super high because the core is where the gravity should be forcing most of the material in to feed that star formation. But alas, they're forgetting that such nodes are the genesis points of the magnetic field system of that cluster, and magnetic fields are what spread and organize material, stifling star formation in molecular clouds. Why would they not think it would work at a simply larger scale? Magnets. And we're moving on to the sun. After the great 1859 solar storm, they began monitoring geomagnetic conditions much more closely. Since that time, the 1989 blast that took out power to Quebec is the highest power storm on record, but still about half of what they think the 1859 event was. And they also tell us that such bigger flares happen about every 25 years, which matches the 30 to 40 percent of solar cycle statistic I gave in the Superstorm series. And here are the good candidates over time. 2003 is a question mark because it really wasn't quite strong enough to make this list, I'm not sure it counts. But truly, the cycle is not so perfect, is it? The 2012 to 2017 sunspot maximum didn't even come close to having something make this list, and so following the general pattern, probably due for another one in the coming years. Interesting solar physics stories up next, and they paint a picture for me that a third potential solar micronova trigger may exist, a resonant one. First, we're seeing how anomalous electromagnetic flows in the field setup itself begin to change before a filament is ejected. Then, as we're getting a close-in look at the electric flows around a larger field setup through a sunspot, which acts almost like a sound speaker but for the electromagnetic waves and resonance within the lowest atmosphere of the sun, between the chromosphere and photosphere, happen to be being simultaneously described by a completely separate study and a completely separate author group as being a full resonance cavity, as I alluded to earlier. Hard to believe those two synced up like that in terms of peer-reviewed publications, and this is critical because a resonance cavity can burst, collapse, resonate to extremes with the softest but on-target vibration. If you start using magnetic fields to change the chemistry in such a region, you could see a tremendous runaway process that results in an ejection. From the sub-photospheric flows to the resonant cavity and the material within it, 
both energetically and chemically. We now have a third mechanism for the galactic midplane current sheet to trigger a solar micronova. Again, it's important to remember, the sheet is not at the galactic equator, but rippling above and below in a standard Parker spiral instability, just like the solar wind within our solar system. Everything we just mentioned as being an excitement of that resonant cavity allows this third potential nova trigger on the sun, which would only eject the corona and maybe parts of the chromosphere, by the way. It is now added to the instability trigger and accretion trigger that we know would apply in such a situation. If you are lost right now, scroll down, click the Cosmic Disaster 2020 playlist, and have a nice day. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our start to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here. But right now, it's 5.25 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.